Hi everyone, my name is Ivan Olenikov and now I'm going to tell you about the protocol we designed with my colleagues uh, Elena Pagnin and Andrei Sabatfeld. Uh, the, proto the protocol will be for solving the proximity testing problem. In this problem we have two parties, uh, each of whom know their locations on the Euclidean plane and we want a protocol which would allow these two parties to somehow exchange messages and to find out whether they are close enough to one another or not, uh, meaning whether the Euclidean distance between them is less than the given threshold value or not. And in particular, we'll be interested in secure protocols for this problem. And the only kind of security we consider here is the security against semi-honest adversaries. In this setting, uh, in this in this setting of security against semi-honest adversaries, uh, we allow any, any of the parties to to try to deduce something that is not supposed to about other parties' inputs only by looking at the messages that the party receives. So uh, the adversary cannot modify, the, like, like deviate from the protocol specifications, m modify the, the messages sent by, by some party, and the adversary cannot uh, capture messages of multiple parties. So the adversary can see messages of only one party and it, it tries to to get something from that. And there, there, there is already an existing protocol for proximity testing. It's called Inner Circle. Uh, the protocol does exactly what we just described in the previous slide. It allows Ellis and Bob to somehow exchange messages and in the end, uh, Ellis gets a single bit B saying whether they're close enough to one another or not. Uh, and there is one property that this protocol does not have, which we often want things we use to have, is uh, the protocol does not allow Ellis and Bob to come online in different moments of time and somehow, like for example, for Bob to submit his data somewhere, like let's say to some central servers, and then for Ellis to, to query the data later. So for, for this inner circle protocol, Ellis and Bob, they literally interact with one another. And this requires both of them to, to be online at the same time. And it does not allow some very, very nice, uh, um, like use cases. Um, and, uh, yeah. So we thought maybe we could plug in a server between the Ellis and Bob and, um, and build a protocol which in, in which all of the Bob's messages would go before all of the Alice's messages. So Bob would somehow interact with the servers, submit his data, and then go offline, and then Alice would come online and query the data. And in, we, we also want such a protocol not to, uh, not, not to provide Alice and Bob with any secret, uh, information before the protocol starts. So Alice and Bob do not share any keys or anything. And it's actually quite easy to see that if there is one server here, then uh, there, it, it's impossible to achieve security against semi-honest adversaries because if Bob submits his data to the server, then the server can query itself on Bob's data, like pretending to be Alice inside like a simulation which is being run inside the server and within that simulation query itself and, and, and get something and learn something about Bob's data. And we don't want that. Therefore, we decided to have two servers here. Uh, with the two servers, Bob can somehow split his data in two and give it to two, two servers and the, there is no single server which could query the data without uh, interacting with the other one. And as we said, we, we consider only those adversaries who, who try to learn something by looking at only one party. So since the information is split between the two servers, it's, it seems like it should be possible. And this picture on the right is actually the protocol we will be building in this talk. Uh, to build the protocol, we will use one uh, very interesting cryptographic construction, it's called linearly homomorphic encryption. Uh, this is uh, pretty much like normal public key encryption with the key generation encryption and decryption algorithms. 
but in addition to that, it allows uh, uh, for these two plus and multiplication operations, which operate on the encrypted data. So the plus operation by given public key and encryption of A and encryption of B, it produces the encryption of A plus B. And the multiplication, it takes the encrypted value on one side and unencrypted one on the other side and produces the encrypted multiplication. And when we say addition and multiplication, of course, we mean that uh, the plain text space is a ring and the addition and multiplication correspond to the operations in that ring. Uh, and also we want the, the crypto system to have a, a separate setup algorithm, which would produce a description of the plain text ring and, uh, the key generation algorithm should, should accept the description of the plain text ring and produce keys for that specific plain text ring. So, uh, this basically means that we can generate the keys beforehand, before the protocol starts, and like distribute it to all the parties. Oh, sorry, not the keys. Uh, we can generate the description of the plain text string and distribute it to all the parties. And then all of them will generate keys separately. Uh, and, um, and, but, but they still will work in the same plain text string. This is very convenient. Uh, yeah. And also we want this, uh, plain text string to be a field which is easily doable if you choose the right parameters for the specific crypto system. And we will use these double square brackets as a notation for encryption of something. And the color of the brackets will correspond to the color of the key with which something is encrypted. Um, let's build the protocol in three simple steps. So right now you may not understand where it, where it's going, but it's okay. So the first step is very simple. After that, it, it's, it will be clear where it's going. Uh, the first step is just to learn to do multiplication. Here, we want a little sub protocol uh, in which Alice would start knowing her public key and some number A, uh, some number from the plain text string, and Bob will start with some number B, and we want the server two in the end here to get the encryption of A multiplied by B. Uh, yeah, so the solution is going to be that Bob will generate a random value, random non-zero value, uh, mask his input by this value and send it to server one, and then send the inverse of the mask to the server two. Then Alice will simply encrypt her value with uh, her public key, forward it to the server one, uh, and forward her key to both of the servers. So now, as you can see, the server one knows the encryption of Alice's number and mask uh, Bob's number. So she can use this uh, holomorphic multiplication uh, to multiply the two values and send the result to the server two, the server two will multiply what it gets from the server one by this inverse of R and get basically A multiplied by B. Uh, yeah, that's pretty much all of it. Uh, we, we are done with this little sub protocol. Uh, we managed to let server two learn the, the encryption of the multiplication. And um, also another nice property that this protocol has is that you can split it into like this and say that all of the messages above this green line, they go before all, all of the messages uh, below the green line, which means that, well, basically these two messages from Bob is Bob submitting his data to the servers. We can say that at this green line, Bob goes offline and Alice comes online only after that. Uh, so this, this means that this small sub protocol still satisfies the property we wanted on the previous slides. When, when we said that all of the Bob's messages should go before all of the Alice's messages. So that there is no like interactiveness between Bob and Alice. Um, yeah. And, uh, all of the future steps in which we will build the final protocol will still satisfy this property. And the final result will also. Uh, let's, let's go to the next step. So now we want something more complicated. We want 
um, uh, we want server 2 to learn the encryption of squared distance between Alice and Bob. So Alice starts knowing her coordinates, Bob starts knowing his coordinates, and uh, yeah, in the end, we, we, we want server 2 to know the squared distance between these two things. Sorry, not the squared distance, but the encryption of squared distance. Uh, so to solve it, let's look at this expression for the squared distance here. As you can see, there are these two symmetric terms. Uh, let's break down the first one. And basically, whatever we say about the first one will apply to the second one too, because they are symmetric. Uh, and also, uh, let's imagine that there is this imaginary one here. So I colored uh, the terms here with the blue and, and, and red, uh, showing the colors of Alice and Bob and showing to whom each of the variables here belongs. Uh, so this first part belongs completely to Alice, which means that she can basically compute XA squared because she knows XA and send the encryption of XA squared to the server to directly. And there are these two other terms which consist of values coming both from Alice and Bob, of values which are both, some of them are blue, some of them are red. And um, so, yeah, the solution is going to be that uh, all the four parties will run the multiplication sub protocol from the previous step to obtain the encryption of this XA multiplied by XB. Uh, to, uh, sorry, to let the server to obtain the encryption of this product and then they will run this multiplication sub protocol again to let the server to get the multiplication of uh, oh, sorry the encryption of this term and i i I've, i put this imaginary blue one here so that it's just easier to see that we can apply the multiplication sub protocol for this term too because we can say that there is this imaginary one which which is being input by Alice into the multiplication sub protocol. And by running this multiplication sub protocol twice, we basically get the, this two, we make the server to learn the encryptions of these two things. And Alice just sends the encryption of this thing and the server two can just use the homomorphic operations to compute the encryption of this whole term like this. And all that applies to the second term too. And after that, the server two can just add up the two values and get the encryption of the, of the D of the square distance. Um, uh, another thing to pay attention here to is that, uh, both of these runs of this sub protocol of the multiplication sub protocol from the previous step should happen in, par in parallel so that this property that Oh, oh, sorry. Uh, so that th this property that all of the Bob's messages go before all of the Alice's messages is still satisfied for two rounds of this protocol. Uh, yeah, now we are done with the second step. Now we know how to let the server to learn the encryption of squared distance. Now we have only last step uh, left to, to, to build the protocol. Uh, after the, after the previous step is done, Alice knows her secret key and the server two knows the encryption of the square distance between Alice and Bob. And now the only thing we need to do is to check whether the square distance is, is, is less than or equal to the, the threshold radius or not. And for this step, we will not need server one and Bob. So only Alice and the server two do this. Uh, to solve it, Let's define this values vi, which is d, the square distance, minus i multiplied by rho, where rho is a uniformly random non-zero element from the ring. Uh, the nice property that this v, that this vi values have is that, uh, if d is equal to i, then d minus i is zero and the whole thing is zero. And if d is not equal to i, then this is non-zero, and after multiplying it by a random non-zero field element, we get a uniform distribution on the on the whole. Uh, I mean, on all the non-zero elements of the field. Um, and also, 
the server to you can compute the encryptions of VIs without anybody's help because the server two knows the, uh, the the encryption of D and the server can sub subtract the I for, for, from this value using the homomorphic operations and then multiply it by uniformly random raw which the server two will generate itself. And since the server two can can compute the encryption of VI, let's make it in, uh, compute all those encryptions for for I's from zero to R squared, and compile this list. Um, actually, this list already in, encodes whether D is less than or equal to R squared, because if if there is at least I in this interval for which D is equal to I, then there is going to be one encryption of zero among these values. And if not, then all of these values are going to be uh, uniformly distributed on non-zero elements. And the server two will assemble this list and shuffle it before and, and, and then send it to Alice. And since the server two shuffled the list, uh, when Alice receives, receives it and decrypts it, uh, if she finds a zero in the list, uh, no, sorry, so Alice will receive this whole list, decrypt all the values one by one, and check if there is at least one zero there. If there is a zero, she knows that this is true. If there is no zero, then she knows this is false. And the server two shuffles the list to make sure that the position of zero does not uh, tell Alice what exactly was the i to which d is equal to. So Alice will not learn the exact distance. Uh, so now we are done building the protocol. Uh, th this is all of it. Now let's recall what just happened. We constructed a protocol which allows Alice and Bob to do proximity testing. Uh, uh, and in, in addition to what other protocols can do, this protocol allows Alice and Bob to come online in different moments of time. And in, uh, the protocol also uses two servers. Uh, and since Alice and Bob, they do not share any data before the protocol starts, like any keys or identities or anything, uh, it means that, um, that Alice can be matched with multiple Bobs. So multiple Bobs, one by one, they can come to the servers, they can submit their data as described in the protocol. And then Alice may come online in the end only once and collect all the data for all the bobs. Uh, yeah, and this is another advantage that we have. And the implementation is quite efficient. Uh, the heaviest computations are done on the servers and it take, takes about 12 seconds for value R equal to zero. Uh, sorry, for, for, for R equal to 100. Um, things that can be improved in the future for this work are maybe we could have support for, for stronger adversaries. Uh, the ones we support right now are pretty weak. Right now we're, we, 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 we guarantee that the protocol is secure if all the parties follow the protocol. Uh, but it would be interesting to see if we can do anything in, in case when uh, the parties, they try to, they, they behave arbitrarily and they try to break something in the protocol. Uh, also, uh, currently the communication cost is quite high. We, we so the, the the amount of data the parties send during the protocol is proportional to R squared. As you can see on the previous slide here, the server two sends this big list in the end, uh, uh, which consists of R squared values. And this is the, the the main communication bottleneck right now. Uh, this this is where most of the communication uh, happens, the, the heaviest communication. Um, yeah, improving that would be good also for the future. And also, we could try to simplify cryptographic assumptions, and for example, maybe look for a protocol which would not, uh, which would which could work with any linearly homomorphic encryption. Uh, because right now we want a very specific uh, linear homomorphic encryption. Or maybe we could try to do something without without any homomorphic encryption. Uh, 
Um, yeah, that's all. Thank you. And this is the only reference I have for the inner circle.